Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program. I'm Dr. Jim Daly of Astronomy for Change, your host, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Alberto Caballero. Alberto holds a master's degree and is the host of the Exoplanets YouTube channel, whose focus is habitable exoplanets, extraterrestrial intelligence, and interstellar travel. He is involved with the Habitable Exoplanet Hunting Project, an international consortium of more than 30 observatories looking for nearby potentially habitable exoplanets. The team recently reported on GJ3470C, the first exoplanet candidate fully discovered by amateur astronomers. Alberto is the author of two recent papers, an approximation to determine the source of the WOW signal, and Solar One, a proposal for the first crewed interstellar spacecraft, with contributions to a major article in Forbes magazine, Inside the 24-7 Search for Another Habitable Planet Within 100 Light Years of Earth. In his most recent paper, he proposes a crewed interstellar craft, Solar One, a starship that could cruise at 30% the speed of light. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Alberto Caballero, and welcome to the program, Alberto. So, thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me here. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. For the so sake of our viewers, let me just introduce this Alberto Caballero, which in Spanish means gentleman. So you're a gentleman. <laughs> so uh, so uh, Alberto is looking for um, radio telescope facilities to expand the search for signals of intelligent origin originating from star systems and planets and he's looking he's looking to reach out to um to as many people as possible who would be who would be willing to um work with him in this project did you want to is that a fair description alberto or yes exactly that's basically what we are doing we are right now we are only two radio observatories well the main reason i decided uh, first of all, I became interested in astronomy. Then I became interested in, in this search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And well, first of all, in extraterrestrial intelligence itself, no, uh, whether or not we are alone. And that led, that led me to actually say, okay, what if I try to actually, because I don't have a radio observatory, but what if I try to find some people interested in this, actually doing it already and try to coordinate something like that and everything started because of the well. I, I I was doing another project. I was coordinating a project a project called the Habitable Exoplanet Hunting Project. We were we were more than thirty observatories looking for exoplanets. So I thought, what well, maybe we could do the same for radio astronomy uh, to search for extraterrestrial. But it's been complicated because there are very few radio astronomy stations compared to radio amateur radio observatories, optical radio observatories. But uh, but the idea is yes is to look for for observatories. We're so far only two radio observatories, one in Finland, uh, and another one in in the USA, uh, in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. And they are actually observing. Uh, we are observing uh, several uh, targets. Mm -hmm. Well, one target at a time, but uh, twenty four seven. We are uh, looking observing uh, specific stars twenty four seven all the time. Wow. So we are gathering all of data. Oh, many, even if we are only we are only two observatories so far, we are still we are already concerned because the good the good thing about radio astronomy is that you don't need good skies. You can actually gather data all the time. So the problem that we were facing with optical <laughs> astronomy, uh, we are not having that problem here. We can observe all the time, most of the time. Twenty four seven. How many how many stars in your target list right now? Right now we have four. For a, I, there are many ways of doing this. I decided uh, that uh, this uh, project would be only focused on on a specific stars. So I chose uh, these stars based on how similar they could be to the sun, for example. Right. Another one, another star has a potential, uh, uh, has a it has an exoplanet candidate, which is which could be um, a potentially habitable, a potentially habitable exoplanet. Uh, and, and this type of uh, classification. So uh, I chose I chose four interesting stars, and we are focusing. We are observing each of each of them one one week each of them. Okay. Uh, so continuously twenty four seven one, and then this next the next week week we move to another one, and that's how we are doing it. But uh, only four, yes. 
Unfortunately, we could have enlisted the help of Arecibo, but that's no longer possible. I'm sure you're aware of the tragic yeah. loss of the Arecibo radio telescope. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Really. So the, the wow signal, 1977, I believe, is when we first saw, uh, you know, the wow signal was first received. I, I was listening, I've been re reading and doing some research on the, the events surrounding the, the wow signal and there's a certain uncertainty as to what part of the sky it's in. And we might just be looking in the wrong part of the sky. Maybe it's in a different part of the sky. There was, see, there was, you know this story about the wow signal, right? There was yep. a, a large unsteer, uh, unsteerable radio antenna listening. And it could be, it was two, there were two nodes listening and we were not sure which node it came from. So the long and short of it is if we could listen 24 seven, like you're doing, then maybe it's broadcasting all the time, but we're just not listening to the right part of the sky. Are you going to, are, are there any efforts in your project and in your work to um, pick up uh, pick up the work with the wow signal or continue looking, studying the wow signal, maybe looking for some, a, a repeat signal? Yeah, in, princi in principle, not. In principle, we are focusing on other parts of the sky uh, based under the idea that uh, the, the wall region, the wall signal region has been observed a lot by many observatories during the last few years. Right. And actually, well, one of the observatories in, in, in our project uh, is observing the wall signal every day, <laughs> the wall oh. signal region every oh. day. And, oh. and, and, and okay. Yeah, he has an amateur radio station, uh, a three meter telescope, but okay. uh, he's observing, he has good equipment uh, and he's observing the, this, this called SETI net. And he's observing okay. the wall signal almost every day, uh, many hours, and he has good candidates. He has some candidates which could be, I mean, not, he has never re uh, found any signal which was similar to the wall signal, but he has some candidates and, um, and some candidates, uh, um, I'm not sure if some, yeah, probably some of them in the hydrogen line, of, of course. Mm -hmm. He's uh, focusing on the hydrogen line. The 21, so, uh, 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he's able to uh, receive more frequencies, but one of them is that one. He's focusing on, on the hydrogen line, not for our project. I mean, for uh, more or less uh, half of the day, uh, he observes uh, the wall signal region, and the other half he observes, uh, he makes observations for our project. And we are actually, the, the four stars I mentioned before, mm -hmm. all of them are outside uh, the region where the wall signal was detected. I, see. I understand. Because, yeah, we believe, for example, the SETI Institute with the Allen Telescope Array, which is a huge yes. array of telescopes. Yes. Yeah, they, are, they, are, they have probably scanned and observed in this region quite a lot in many frequencies. And so far, they didn't really find uh, the wall signal being repeated. What about enlisting the help of the square kilometer array, which is just coming on, up, coming up. I think it, they just started observing with it, or it's just coming online now. The square kilometer array in Australia. Yeah. What about sending? Yeah, they, what about what about speaking to them, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, uh, of, of course they are, and they, that will be the the biggest <laughs> really telescope yeah, in, right. in the world. And uh, and they are building it right now. They are actually uh, Mirkat is one of the part is one of the arrays of the of the whole project. It is called Mirkat. Uh, it's actually operative right now. I believe I they are already observing. So part okay. of the SKA has already finished uh, the construction, uh, and I don't know how many collecting area they have right now. But uh, but I, I have not contacted so far with them. I have been in contact with other organizations such as Breakthrough Initiatives, for example. Yes, I was going to ask you about them. Yeah, but yeah, uh, great with SKA, listen. yeah, I have not comp contacted yet because I mean. I don't know. It's like many countries. There are many countries uh, paying in that project. I, I'm not sure if. I mean, they, of course, one of the uh, one of the components of their research they are going to do is sec is setting is going to be okay. extraterrestrial intelligence. But they are also researching many other things. So maybe, yeah, maybe uh, maybe they might not be interested. Maybe yes. Yeah, of course, I could contact them. Of course, in the future. 
it's just something I was just thinking. I'm just you know, thinking off the top of my head here. Okay, so would you um, want to speak to the, introduce your website? And maybe if someone were to visit your website, and I can share it here, let me share it. Okay, can you see, can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so someone has your website here. Very, very nice website, Alberto. Thank you. So, um, if we click the first uh, link here, discover exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets outside our solar system. Most of which, uh, with the Kepler and the Kepler two missions, we found upwards. I think it's about four thousand exoplanets. Of the vast majority of them are not planets that would be um, suitable for life as we know it. Either they're too big, too far away, or they're just super hot, super cold. Only a small percentage of them are planets you know, suitable for life, life as we know it within the so-called habitable zone or the region around every star where water could exist in liquid form, right? So that's the so-called so called Goldilocks zone. To establish some context and background, the habitable zone is the region around every star where water could exist in a liquid state. The Morgan Keenan Spectral Classification Scale classifies stars by temperature and color, with blue as the hottest and red as the coolest. An M-class star is the coolest. K is the next, followed by G, the classification of our sun. The cooler the star, the longer it will live with stars such as Proxima Centauri, our closest stellar neighbor, a good example of a cool red dwarf star. A star's luminosity, its intrinsic or fundamental brightness, is linked to its temperature. The hotter the star, the greater the luminosity. The habitable zone is therefore linked to the stars to a star's luminosity. The more luminous the star, the broader the extent of the habitable zone with a corresponding greater distance where it would be cool enough for water to exist in a liquid state. Simply put, this Goldilocks zone depends on the star's luminosity. So why is water so important? The presence of water in any environment will be essential to finding life similar to our own. If the environment is too hot, water would only exist as a gas. If too cool, it would only exist as ice. We are thus looking for stars whose habitable zones are similar or perhaps more conducive to life than our own. Those stars would have the sun at the hot end of the range, of that range, with cooler G-class stars or hotter K-class stars, the ideal candidates. We're now going to take, look, take a look at three simulations, all of which will have the Earth at its current distance of one astronomical unit from the host star. The habitable zone is depicted in these examples as green. The red zone is too hot, where water could only exist as a vapor, and the blue zone is too cold, and thus water could only exist there as ice. The first example will be of our solar system in its current form. Notice that the Earth is on the inside edge of the Sun's habitable zone, whereas Mars is actually right in the middle. We now switch to Alpha Centauri b, the companion to Alpha Centauri a, with Proxima Centauri, we mentioned previously, as the third member of the triple star system. Alpha Centauri b is a great example of a K-class star. Notice where our hypothetical Earth is, as well as the prevailing average temperature. Notice that, unlike the current real distance of the Earth from the Sun in our own solar system, one, astro one astronomical unit is right in the center of the green, or Goldilocks zone. The location that Mars now occupies in the previous simulation in, in the real solar system. Switching to the smallest, coolest example, the simulation of Proxima Centauri, a cool M class star, otherwise known as a red dwarf. Notice the distance from the star to the Earth of one astronomical unit. This distance is well beyond the outer boundary of the star's habitable zone. Any life-bearing planets in orbit around such a star would thus have to lie much closer in. In your project, um, I, would, I would imagine that you would restrict the candidate stars to within, let's say, M-class, G-class, 
M class, K class, and G class stars. And I would think maybe more towards the K class stars would be the more ideal candidate. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, of course. I mean, K type of stars are, are really interesting. Uh, because uh, it is believed that superhabitable exoplanets, those which are those planets planets that could be more habitable than Earth, uh, could exist around uh, K-type stars inst instead of G-type. But um, but uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm focusing more. We are focusing more on G-type stars. We are okay. um, the research. The search we are doing is more focused on stars. We uh, similar or in principle similar to the sun. I see. Uh, life could perfectly exist around K type stars, but maybe that life could be a little bit different than our yeah. life because the problem of K type, uh, despite they have longer life spans, K type stars last longer. Yes. So uh, life could be, uh, could there could be could be more common in these kind of planets, but the problem is that they usually emit more X radiation. Yes, uh, and actually, the sun is quite a, a big star. The sun within a, 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 within the G type a, a spectrum of of stars, a, a G type stars are actually more similar than more similar to F type rather than to K type. That's true. The, the 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 sun the temperature of the sun is almost six thousand. It's five thousand eight hundred. It's closer to um, so K type might have too much radiation for. Mm -hmm. what we are actually used to but of course life could perfectly exist about actually around any type of planet uh, uh, in the habitable zone that's that's, uh, that's a good point now yeah. it being uh, an astron my my take on it is the sun stars like our sun um you have the, the spectral class and then you have the luminosity class the luminosity class just speaks to a star size the spectral class speaks to its temperature stars that are like an, a G1, a G2 star is actually on the hot side of the G class. So like I would imagine like a G5 or a G7 star would be almost ideal if we could find one that's um, has minimal flaring, X-ray flares, radiation, things like that could be brought to a, be a minimum. That would be the ideal star. So F class stars and A class stars simply don't li live long enough where life could actually evolve, thrive, and and uh, do well as do as well as it has here. So, um, in my view, the G two class star is actually the upper limit, I would yeah. think. And we're fortunate that the sun is very quiet. Yeah. And and I don't know if you if you happen to see the eclipse that was visible in Latin America yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, it was. You saw the, the partial phase of the sun. The sun is completely blank. There's no no activity at all. Very quiet. So we're at a solar minimum. So the sun is is quiet. Yet it's on the high side of what we would consider as a star that's suitable. So a G five G seven star. As any candidates, uh, how how do you decide? Alberto, what, what candidate stars to put in your list? That's where I'm going with this. That was the reason for the question. Sure. Uh, do you mean, sorry, for the SETI project? For your, yeah, yeah. Let me go back um, for the, um, the SETI project. Yes. Okay. Right here. Yeah. Exactly. This, the, yes. Yeah, basically, um, that's true. Well, of course, a, a uh, uh, the Earth is probably not the best planet in the whole universe. <laughs> we might be better uh, living in another planet instead of the Earth. Uh, but well, we have adapted ourselves to this planet. Uh, we are adapted. We have adapted to this gravity that we have. But there are billions of planets, so there might be another planet with the same gravity, with you know, and that could be even better. Uh, because right now here on Earth, there are many places which uh, which are really diff it's really difficult to live. In Africa, there is no water in many places. I know. In, in the Antarctic, so there are many places on Earth that for us it's really really hard um, a hard environment. So there might be planets, uh, maybe not close to to the Earth, but uh, which could be even better, no? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, but yeah, what you said, that's true. I mean, there could be another star uh, the same way that there could be another planet which that could be better than the Earth. There could be another star which could be better for us. And 
And actually, the Earth is not in the middle of the habitable zone of the solar system. No, it's the, the most solar. ideal, exactly, the most ideal, the, in theory, the most ideal area part of a system is that one, the one that is closer to the middle of the habitable zone. And we are cl rather close yes. uh, to, the, to the, so that's why the things like climate change, climate change might get uh, even worse, no? Uh, due to that uh, location, maybe in the, inside the, and then, and then I wonder, not all the problems related with flares or uh, what's, we are fortunate, for, fortunately, we don't have flares, strong flares in our sun, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, basically another type of star could be another classification, another class of a star within the G type could be better. Uh, the thing is that, well, I believe that the G, G, uh, G type stars, which are actually uh, hotter than the sun, and closer to the F type, I guess that they usually emit more ultraviolet radiation. Yes. So um, for us, for humans, ultraviolet radiation, we need light, but uh, ex an excessive amount amount might not be healthy for us. So, yes. so on exactly. the one side, you have exactly an, ex an excess of maybe on, of ultraviolet radiation uh, for G type stars closer closer to the F type, and uh, but on the other on the other side you have may maybe more X radiation, which is also bad for us. So, yeah, it's difficult to know which star could be the best. But yeah, of course, another star could be better. Yes. 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 Alberto, what about the uh, what we see here, the SETI project? How can how can every everyday people get involved in your project? On, on this uh, page we see here, there are two possibilities, SETI at home and the SETI project. Could you speak to those, either one of those? And, sure, and, yeah. Well, yeah. And how, how someone could get involved, actively get involved in your project and um, help us look, try to find signals of intelligent origin. Yeah, well, the, the, in well, in my babes website, I, I sometimes I part of the projects that are in my website I belong to other people. They are I just include them in my oh, website, I see. I see. so other people can actually contribute to them. And uh, another and some some others are actually coordinated by me. Which, for example, City Home is coordinated not by not by me, but uh, it's coordinated by by it was coordinated because right now the City Home is not active. Uh, anymore, I believe, but uh, it was coordinated by the University of California or something like that. Uh, Berkeley, Berkeley, I believe it was Berkeley, Berkeley. exactly. Nice. And uh, but yes, City Project, yeah, anybody can actually access uh, the the website, and they have a, a contact form uh, in the website uh, that they can use to contact me. If they have, if they are, they have an antenna for the City Project. You only need to have uh, an antenna, a big, a, a, oh. a big antenna. Between two and three meters could be en enough. One meter is a little bit marginal. I mean, yeah. it's, it's but uh, two meters, two point one, three meters that would that would be enough. And then uh, also you need a feed horn to be able to uh, which frequency. It doesn't matter. We are we are observing in the hydrogen line, but we are m focusing on on other frequencies as well. Right. So any 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 kind of frequency would be would do the, would be okay uh, actually. Right. 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 So if they, yeah, if they, anybody with equipment, if they are interested in radio astronomy, they can actually contact me. They can tell me their uh, their what equi what equipment they have, and what observe what they schedule, what uh, during what times uh, uh, they would be able to observe. And yeah, and they could, they are more than welcome to. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, you have the yeah, contact form uh, at okay, the right. So I got them. That's fine. Oh, and these are the target stars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just so a couple of them are sun-like stars, probably, but the other two, uh, we don't know. One of them is well. One of them, as I, I was saying, is a, it has a potentially habitable exoplanet. A really uh, one candidate that is really similar to the Earth. Actually, I Which, think it is the fourth star. It's really, really similar. The, the candidate is really, really similar to the Earth. If it proves to be true, if it is, if it is confirmed, it, it is still a candidate. And the the third star, I think, well, one of the one of the others, is actually uh, close to the distance. Well, uh, I could say that uh, uh, Claudio Macone mm -hmm. is an astrophysicist who proposed that the closest civilization could be one thousand and nine hundred light years away. 
he, they, he made a, math a mathematical study and came to the conclusion that that could be the distance of the closest civilization. So one, one of what, those is, yeah. 1,000, what was it? 1,900. One, oh, okay, okay. 1,933 light years away. So one of the stars I chose was based on that. It, it is the close. It is the star closest to that distance. Okay. And it, you know, I mean, it could be it could be a good way or a bad way of doing it, but I, it's just a way I cho I chose to select one of them. Right. And actually, it's funny because uh, well, I made another paper a paper about the WOW signal. And the main candidate that I proposed for the WOW signal is actually 1,800 light years away. Mm. And, and, and Macone said that the closest one could be, the closest civilization could be 1,900. So they are very similar in distance. Yes, I mean, yes, it, could, yes. it could be coincidence or who knows. <laughs> so around a, a, a one way, a two way conversation would take almost 4,000 years. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it would be impossible. No. <laughs> it would so be it just the knowledge that the knowledge that we're not alone and this is a civilization on that at that star might give us the motivation and the uh, to develop the technology, perhaps in some future time, to uh, be able to go visit. Right now. We know the special theory of relativity prevents us from going out or above the speed of light. So if we can do something with general theory, general relativity, warp space and fly through space time, much as much in the way the Starship Enterprise did. Yeah, which some of the science does have a basis in, in you know, some of the ideas in that show do have some basis in general relativity. So it's not too far fetched. But that technology is, is centuries away. And it would be a multinational effort. It would be a worldwide effort to do this. So we'd have to solve a lot of problems. But with this will, there's a way, there's hope. So my point is that the knowledge that such a civilization exists and that we found evidence, real hard concrete evidence, that we're not alone and there, there, there they are. That would be enough, I think, to to, to change people's hearts and minds. I think it would be a fantastic day for humanity. Yeah. It would be a, a, a watershed moment in all of human history if we actually discovered real evidence of another civilization, a technical civilization that has the ability to communicate with us. Yeah, yeah certainly. I think it will be the, mo the most important day <laughs> in yeah. humanity for exactly. humanity. Exactly. And that would be that would give a, a, that would give a boost in in terms of funding to uh, yes. other SETI projects exactly. for interstellar research travel research. That would be uh, I mean we would actually get probably an interstellar ship uh, this century if we <laughs> <laughs> yes. because there is no there is no investment there is almost zero invest, investment and funding to inter, to research on interstellar I travel. Know. NASA barely researches on this so. Uh, most I of know. the research is done by non-profit organizations such as I don't know Icarus Interstellar, etc. So, uh, so once we <laughs> we find that, uh, but even if it's uh, far away, I mean, uh, even if it's far away, that would probably give uh, give a, a boost in funding and uh, to the research. Uh, very, exactly. Very exactly. Well, they have the the. Uh... They're getting ready to launch the James Webb Telescope. I think it used to be March of next year. Now it's October. I think they moved the date out to October. That will also help since the James Webb Telescope yeah. is a largely infrared, infrared observatory. A lot of these cooler stars, we're gonna look for uh, chemical signatures in atmospheres of exoplanets. That would go a long way in helping us identify real candidates too. Yeah. Maybe as a confirmation, we can find some, you know, organic compounds in the atmosphere, ozone changes in ozone layers. And there's, I was watching a, a documentary where the changes in the chemical signature of the planet would indicate life or the activities of life. So there would be one way to confirm that. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
reports. So, and... how else? Um... How else should people get involved with the project, Alberto? So if we go back here, interstellar, let's solve interstellar problems. We're talking about actually going there, the breakthrough yeah. star shot. Can you describe for our viewers what this breakthrough star shot initiative is? Yeah, breakthrough, uh, breakthrough initiatives is basically a nonprofit organization uh, researching on a uh, Mm, well, they started researching on interstellar travel. Uh, they started actually with this project, and the Starshot project, and they not, right now they are also conducting other research, SETI research as well, uh, and um, and basically, um, no, the, the Starshot project, which is the main project in, in of breakthrough breakthrough initiatives, is about sending nanocrafts to Proxima B, which is the closest yes. potentially habitable exoplanet. The idea would be to send 1,000 uh, miniature spacecrafts, small, really small spacecrafts, uh, with light sails. Uh, so its spacecraft would have uh, a, a mini miniature, uh, a small light sail. Well, no, the, the, the spacecraft itself is really small, but the light sail is, uh, I think it's one meter by one meter or something yeah, like that. The light sail is not that small, of course. But the rest of the components are pretty small, and the idea would be to send them via a laser, a laser uh, beam, Focus with a, exactly with a laser installation, uh, with a laser facility uh, on Earth uh, right. on the ground. Uh, I think it's 100 uh, gigawatt, 100 gigawatts of power that the, the amount of power that will be needed to propel those tiny spacecrafts up to 20% the speed of, speed of light. light. So they would arrive to Proxima Centauri in about 20 years or so. 20 years. Wow. And, uh, and yeah, that's I, the closest neighbor in space. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, that's the closest okay. one. And uh, that would be a great idea to actually to try to image uh, Proxima B, which is the purpose of, of those tiny exactly. spacecrafts. But also we are working, uh, in the, the, the first image of a potentially habitable exoplanet is expected to arrive in 2025, in just four years, because oh. we are now right now building several huge uh, telescopes on Earth, mm -hmm. and these telescopes, with the help of a um, coronagraph, they will uh, sorry coronagraph um, coronagraph yeah they will be able exactly they will be able to to the, to directly image uh, exoplanets. The giant, I think the giant Magellan telescope and the and and the Rubin the Verity Rubin telescope I think yeah. the two telescopes yeah yeah exactly yeah but of course it's not the same you know with the with the spacecraft if we send a spacecraft there uh, able to emit the the planet the images will be much more much better with much better resolution sure. than actually taking images from here <laughs> even if you use a 30 meter or 40 meter telescope and the images uh, on, on on site in, in uh, there, I mean, uh, I think it's uh, the, the spacecrafts would fly uh, near the star, near Proxima B, at, at, at the distance of uh, 100 astronomical units. I'm not sure, something like that. So not really close, but enough to actually, in theory, able to be able to. 100 I use is pretty good. It's pretty, and they would also be close to Alpha, Alpha A and Alpha B. I don't know at, when they got there or when they would launch. The whole this it's a triple star system, so we, it would depend on where the, the other stars were, the other two components. Alpha yeah, and Alpha B. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In principle, in principle the, the idea would be to emit everything that is there. Uh, what, I mean, uh, you you are going to spend many billions of of, of dollars, so uh, the, the best way is to use it uh, to to take advantage as much as possible of. <laughs> So to try to emit uh, as much as you can uh, once you are in the solar system, but uh, but once but I guess that it's difficult to manage the star because it's uh, you are going to send the nanocrafts in one direction. You have to be really careful to actually to choose uh, the correct direction yes. because otherwise it will go. And once the spacecraft, the small spacecraft, is outside, uh, it's outside the solar system in the interstellar space. You are not able to actually. 
a change the trajectory of the spacecraft. So That's true. Um, it's like uh, we w they will try their best, but uh, it's limited to the point of not being not being able to manage the spacecraft in interstellar space. Yes, it's once it's once it's on a trajectory. We know Newton's first law. Newton's first law says it's going to stay that way until something changes it. Yeah, pretty much. Now, Solar One is a paper that you wrote. I believe yep. this, is, this is it. Um, a proposal for the first crewed interstellar spacecraft. It's a whole paper, Alberto. Could you just give us a, uh, just a quick, uh, a quick rundown on what you sure. propose? Yeah, basically I propose um, a combination of uh, several uh, proposals proposals that already existed. I propose a combination between a, a lesser beamed uh, power propulsion, no, la well, beamed power propulsion, uh, which is the thing that a Starshot project will, will use, uh, using right. a laser, pointing a laser into a light cell. And I, I, co I combine that with a uh, electromagnetic propulsion, specifically the pulsar rambiet. So Solar One, which is the name I give to the spacecraft, would use a beam power propulsion uh, for, accelerate, uh, for acceleration, to accelerate the spacecraft, and right. it would use electromagnetic propulsion, a pulsar scoop specifically, to uh, decelerate, to stop the spacecraft uh, before reaching destination. So it's kind of a combination between, because the primary, uh, the main uh, challenge, the main disadvantage of uh, the Bossard, Bossard Rambiet is that uh, a way the, the, uh, it the, the, the Bossard scoop produces a lot of drag during acceleration. So that's why the Bossard Rambiet is a good proposal, but right. that's, the main, that's the main problem of the, of the project is that the drag that produces the electromagnetic uh, scoop uh, is quite huge and the acceleration, there is a limit in the speed that the spacecraft can actually uh, have. But uh, with Solar One, we are removing that uh, talent, what that uh, disadvantage. We are using for acceleration a, dif a totally different uh, method of propulsion, which is beamed power propulsion. And I propose basically to use uh, sunlight. Uh, I propose to send several parabolic mirrors close to the sun and use that sunlight sunlight to propel the light cell of the spacecraft. Okay. I also talk about laser, using lasers, but the amount of power that you would need oh. is it's, it's going to be really difficult to actually build a laser, uh, a, a continuous wave laser with such power. Power, uh, so it's but that's why I believe it could be easier to use sunlight instead. Right, or perhaps a fusion reactor. Could yeah, actually, a fusion reactor is needed because uh, the problem with uh, Bassar, the, the Bassar is the problem with using a Bassar scoop is that uh, if you want to. Uh, you are traveling at a uh, 30% of the speed of light mm -hmm. and you need to stop the spacecraft. <laughs> right. So you need a lot of electromagnetic force. And uh, for that, to, to have that electromagnetic propulsion, you need a huge uh, buzzer scoop. But so the, 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 if you want to reduce the size of the buzzer scoop to something like, like it, 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 to something like more or less a few meters, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise, uh, 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 if you don't reduce the size of the passenger scoop, you are going to have a scoop of 40 kilometers or 50 kilometers, yeah. which is quite, uh, it's not feasible. I think it's quite difficult to build that. So if you want to reduce the size of the passenger scoop, you need a laser uh, in the front of the spacecraft to actually ionize hydrogen. So the buzzer scoop could easily uh, mm -hmm. collect a higher amount of hydrogen. That's yes, the yes, mean, yes. exactly that has proposed by another author, uh, author the, the thing about using the laser to ionize hydrogen that was proposed by, I, know, I don't remember the name, but- no, I, I do but, know, I know what you mean. You're exactly, right. exactly. So if you want to a laser, you need uh, to power the laser somehow. So that's why I propose a compact fusion reactor as the best way to power uh, uh, a, high, a high energy laser, laser, which I propose that it could be one terawatt of power, but it could be less. It, it sure. doesn't, I propose one terawatt, but it could be less. You can use a fission reactor instead of fusion, but but the, the main idea would be that, yeah, use uh, a beamed power propulsion for acceleration, a electromagnetic propulsion for deceleration, and a nuclear fusion to, or nuclear fission to, uh, to power the laser that would allow the passenger scoop to collect 
to collect a higher amount of hyd hydrogen. To, in order to eventually slow the, because at the halfway mark, you would have to start slowing down. Otherwise you'll overshoot. Exactly. At 30% exactly. the speed of light, that's considerable. And relativity isn't going to start playing a real major role at that point. But you still, it's still considerable and you'd have to start slowing down at the halfway point. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, you have to slowly down. And rather than collecting higher amount of hydrogen, the purpose would be to actually produce a, a higher electromagnetic field with a smaller uh, scoop. That would be the main. Yeah. Uh, that's why I believe that it would be necessary to uh, to, to 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 use a, a nuclear reactor that would actually produce a, the nuclear reactor would actually power both the la laser and also the scoop because the scoop, if you have a scoop, you need a lot of electricity. And so yeah. you need something powering that. And I think that a, a, compact, a compact nuclear reactor would be the best idea to power both the laser and, and the and the, and the passer scoop. Yeah, whether it's nuclear fusion or nuclear fission, the idea was we need a reliable, sustainable power source to do this. And that would yeah. be the, the nuclear reactor, either one. Yeah. With the either the ITER, uh, uh, project in the south of France right now, we're going to see how well nuclear fusion will work out going forward within the next yep. few years. By 2025, I think it's going to come online as a demonstration proof of concept, the ITER uh, yep. in the south of France. Um, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. I hope, I hope, hope it's going to work out. Yeah. I Not to change the subject, but to, to address the climate change, which is at this point, almost an existential threat. The amount of money that was put into, let's say, the money and the resources okay. invested in the Manhattan Project at the uh, towards the close of World War II to create weapons, we should use that same intent and sense of urgency, pouring money into, I think, pouring money, not pouring money, but use it wisely, but effectively in developing solid nuclear fusion, the yeah. same sense of urgency. I understand ITER is a multinational project and there's a lot of countries involved, but um, so we have a lot, of, a lot of issues that will require technology to address. This is one of them, the solar project. If we find concrete evidence of an intelligent source and intel the origin of an intelligent signal, but there's a big a demand for engineers and scientists, physicists, and people such as yourself to actually, uh, if, if it does nothing else, Alberto, I would say that this project of yours is, is raising awareness, putting the idea out there that you don't have to, ha you can get involved in projects like this, anybody can, which I think is extraordinarily important. And I'm happy that we're a part of this and that we, yeah, so, thank you. I mean, yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. and actually, nuclear fusion would be a great way, for example, uh, to, to for the to power the the lasers for the Starshot project. You need 100 gigawatts. That's right. But if you have nuclear fusion, <laughs> you no. can do it almost it's instantaneously. Like, right, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's for us for 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 everything for interstellar communication for interstellar travel, and yeah. Yeah. Very good. So, is there any is there anything in, to conclude, Alberto, that you would like to say? Um, is there any anything you would like to say to our audience before we conclude? Well, well in principle, not. I, I recently wrote a paper called uh, "Approximation to Determine the Source of the Wow Signal." Uh, they can read more about that in archive. Oh, yeah, exactly that one. Yeah, uh, if they are interested in the Wow Signal, well, they might find this paper interesting. Uh, because yeah, I, I propose some candidates that could be similar to the sun uh, and uh, another way to try to see if we could find the source of the war signal if, if, it, if it was actually artificial instead of just a natural natural event. But, uh, but yeah, basically, uh, yeah, I, I, if anybody's interested in joining the SETI project, uh, they are more than welcome and yeah, we will continue doing the research several weeks more. Uh, the idea was to actually do uh, research on that project one month. Uh, one, uh, it's a start one week, 
but there have been some delays, so probably we will continue observing next next year as well. Okay, yeah. very good, very good. Um, very good. So this one here, this one here, this one here, this. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the habitable. Yeah, what I was referring to the habitable yeah. supplement hunting project. They basically, I have only written two papers, uh, the solar one paper and well, the the, the web signal paper, and also a, in this project, the twenty four seven search. Of uh, of habitable planets, we wrote a paper. Uh, we were, uh, I think, twenty authors in the paper, something like that, fifteen or twenty, uh, uh, because uh, we we found some candidates, uh, some exoplanet candidates. None of them potentially habitable, but uh, well, <laughs> some of them are inside the habitable zone of the star that we were monitoring. So, uh, and we wrote a paper, and it's also in archive. Uh, it's not peer reviewed so far. Because we, they are only candidates, so we are. But uh, but uh, yeah, anybody can uh, actually. Uh, right now, we are focusing more on the SETI project. Uh, okay, but, okay. So uh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. Focusing on the SETI project, and yeah. you host your own YouTube channel too, Exoplanets, I believe. It's a planet channel. Exoplanets, exactly. yeah. the Exoplanets channel, and I'll put a link uh, to to your YouTube channel in the description below, as well as all the information anybody would need to. Uh, well, the link to the contact page. And, um, and encourage everybody to definitely get involved. It's a fabulous project, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. <laughs> yes, sir, absolutely. And um, I'm going to include all the information in the uh, in the comment section. Anyway, Alberto, please stay well, stay safe. And um, perfect. Thank you very much for everything, and take care of you too. <laughs> thank you. Nice to thank meet you. you. Nice to meet you too, Alberto. Thank you. Sure. Bye. The great philosopher Plato famously said, astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads us from this world to another. Astronomy for Change is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to effect positive change through astronomy and science education. It is our belief that by inspiring and empowering current and future generations to become interested and engaged in astronomy and science, this positive change will be realized. If you found this video helpful and educational, please like, subscribe, and share. Also, why not consider supporting us on Patreon? Head over to our homepage, astronomyforchange.org, click support us via PayPal or Patreon, and choose a membership level suitable for you. Every little bit helps, support, helps us produce the great content and further our mission. Also, why not consider becoming a member? Membership is free at Astronomy for Change. Choose the membership membership link here, click it, put your name and your first name or, and your email, and you'll be added to our list. You'll receive a comprehensive digest of all our videos and articles and all our great content. Joining and becoming a patron helps us grow and improve and more fully realize our mission. Thank you. This is Dr. Jim Daly for Astronomy for Change. Until the next video, please stay well and keep looking up.